Hi all, Tom from Amplified Parts here. Today we're going to show you our process for putting together an eyelet board pedal build. The circuit is going to be a one knob germanium fuzz face with the fuzz control set internally to max. We're going to start with a black Hammond 5090B which has been drilled for a one knob battery only build with top jacks and a battery disconnect rocker switch. We also have a web guide for this build which is linked in the description below. The web guide has the build materials with an easy way to add all items to your cart as well as a copy of this final build layout diagram which may be helpful to reference. Note that YouTube has built in playback speed controls if you find it beneficial to slow down any part of this video. We're mounting the board by installing it on standoffs. These can be screw mounted or mounted using epoxy as we have done in this case. We have another video showing that process which we will link in the description. We're going to start by inserting the components and securing them in place but not soldering yet. First, we'll start with the lowest profile components, which are the resistors. I bend the leads by hand into a rough U-shape and insert the leads into the target holes. Then I flatten the component to the board, centering it as I do so. The extra leads are bent around the board to temporarily secure the components in place. This process can then be repeated for all resistors on the board. As the board is going to be a little crowded with everything installed, I like to install placeholder mounting hardware while I'm installing components. This allows me to easily lay out the components in a way that leaves room for the mounting hardware. In place of the 8.2 kilo ohm resistor found in the original Arbiter fuzz face circuit, I'm using a 10k trim potentiometer to allow for bias adjustment. The leads are bent just slightly to make it into the eyelet holes and the leads are bent outward as much as possible to secure it. Once the resistors are installed, we follow the same process with the capacitors, making sure to properly orient the electrolytics. When transistor leads are kept long, I like to insulate them to minimize the risk of any shorts occurring. Here I'm using the sleeving of Gavit cloth wire. We also sell old style spaghetti wire sleeving by the foot, which can be used to easily insulate any exposed leads. I cut one piece to the desired length, a little shorter than the transistor leads. I then use that one piece to cut five more to the same length, one for each leg of the two transistors. The sleeving can be scrunched down and the internal wire can be pulled out, leaving just the insulation. This can then be slid over the legs of the transistors. I'm using green here to mark the collector. Before installing the transistors, I'm bending some of the component leads back towards the center of the board. This can leave more room for additional components to be inserted into the eyelets, which is helpful when adding a third or fourth lead or wire. The transistor leads can be installed similarly to the resistors, simply by inserting the leads and bending them outward to temporarily secure them. In this layout, one of the leads of transistor Q2 extends across the board, so we form the leads as well as we can before installing. This board is going to be installed in a 1590B, which is quite a small enclosure, so we'll bend the transistor flatter to ensure fit. We will do the same with Q1 after it has been soldered. Before installing the offboard wire, we'll make all onboard wiring connections. Standard wire can be used here, though I tend to use the existing component leads when possible. First, I'm bending a few leads roughly into place. Once all connections have been made to an eyelet, they can be soldered. Here I'm soldering all connections on the bottom of the board. This lead here is bent into place for connecting the two eyelets. Once the soldering is done, the excess leads are clipped. Note that if you cannot fit everything into one eyelet, or if you forget to make a connection and don't want to resolder, these extended leads can be used to make additional connections. Here I'm bending a ground lead back over itself to make a loop for connecting a wire. With Q1 soldered insecurely, we'll bend it flat onto the board as well to keep the build compact. There are three eyelets on the top of the board that are now ready to be soldered permanently. Like we did on the bottom, we're going to bend the excess leads into place to make the onboard connections. Note that unlike the bottom eyelets, two of the eyelets that are common on the top of the board are not side by side. I'm bending their leads around the eyelet that is between them, but a simple insulated wire would work fine as well. Now that the leads are in place, I'm bending their ends around each other to secure them for soldering.
Now we'll clip any extra leads from the soldered eyelets. With the board in its final location, we cut wire to the length of the offboard connections by eyeballing the required length. With the wire cut to the right lengths, it can be installed in the target eyelets. Once that final connection has been made and soldered to the eyelet, the excess leads can be clipped. Now we'll measure the necessary length for the ground wire. Remember that I'm using a wire loop for this connection, but either of the common ground eyelets would work too. Because the potentiometer lugs are underneath the board when it's installed, all connections to the pot lug should be made before installing the board, and lug 1 connects to ground. There's a ground connection on the board it can be wired to, but because the board is not installed yet, it's easier to make the ground connection elsewhere. We're going to connect it to the grounded bus wire installed between the jack sleeves. First, we'll cut some bus wire for the connection. By eyeing with a pair of pliers, I'm putting two 90 degree bends in it, spaced roughly at the same distance as the jack sleeve lugs, and cutting the bent leads short. Adjust the bends as needed and drop it into the two lugs, then solder it into place. The jack sleeves and potentiometer body are both common to the chassis, but to prevent any errant connections, I am bending this wire slightly away from the pot as well. Now pot lug 1 can be connected to the ground via the bus wire. I'll take another wire length measurement for it, and then install and solder this wire. Lug 3 of the potentiometer is connected to the board. Using the installed wire, we will solder this connection with the board floating. Last, we'll measure out a length of wire for the lug 2 connection. This is the output of the effect, which connects to a lug on the foot switch. Now that all the potentiometer connections are in place, we can install the board in place and solder the remaining off-board connections. I pulled the switch just slightly out of frame here, but I'm soldering this foot switch connection here, which is the effect output. Next, we'll solder the negative 9 volt connection to one of the lugs of the battery switch. Now we'll solder the board's ground connection to the ground bus. First, we put a loop in the stripped end and hook it onto the ground bus before soldering it into place. Now we will install the wires running from the foot switch to the quarter inch jacks. Note that the input jack is connected to two lugs on the foot switch. A separate wire can be run from one lug to the other, though the connection can also be made with a single wire which we will do here. For the input jack wire, enough insulation should be stripped off of one end to thread it through both foot switch lugs. A thin pair of pliers can help pull the exposed wire through both lugs. We also carry a zero ohm resistor which can be used in place of the wire connection when connecting foot switch lugs. Here I'm soldering both foot switch lugs for the input jack. This connection is for the output jack. I'm using top coated wire here which is bound together with solder. It requires no tinning of the wire and the wire also stays in place better than standard stranded wire which allows for more control over the wire routing. We'll now connect these wires to the tip lugs of the input and output jacks. To install the battery contacts, we first connect them to an actual 9 volt battery so that we can get an idea of how it will sit in the pedal. We are also using an adhesive mount strain relief so that if the battery falls out, the wires tug on the strain relief rather than the solder connections. To do so, we run wire leads through one side of the plastic. With the battery in its desired location, slide the strain relief to roughly where it should be in the enclosure, leaving a little extra slack. With the strain relief held in place, tie a tight knot around the strain relief. Now, the adhesive backing can be removed, and it can be installed on the side wall of the enclosure. In a tight build like this, it may have been wise to mount the board just slightly to one side to leave a little more clearance, but this can just slide in on this build. Note that many enclosures, including this one, have a lip around the lid, so the strain relief should be mounted with a little room above it for the lid. With the strain relief installed, the battery leads can be soldered in. The red positive lead should connect to the input jack's ring lug, which will cause the battery to disconnect when the input plug is removed. The black negative lead should connect to the unused lug of the rocker switch, which allows for battery disconnection using the switch. The final wire we will install connects one of the foot switch lugs to the ground bus, shorting the effects input to ground when disengaged. This is not strictly necessary, but it can prevent pops and clicks when the effect is engaged. 
We'll form a hook at one end of the wire to hook it onto the bus wire, and then pinch it with pliers to secure it for soldering. At this point, all the internals are wired up, and we can use the internal trim pot to set the bias. We'll make sure a battery is installed, the battery switch is turned on, and a monoplug is inserted into the input jack. With a multimeter, connect the leads to ground on the ground bus and Q2's collector via the trim pot leads. With the trim pot turned all the way down, we get nearly the negative battery voltage on Q2. In this build, turning it all the way up maxes out at about negative 5.7 volts. Negative 4 to negative 5 volts is an often recommended bias range for germanium fuzz faces. The voltage in original units varied, but reported voltages tend to be in that ballpark. However, there's usually a wide range that can sound nice. The original Vox tone bender that we have here uses the same circuit topology as the Arbiter fuzz face, and its Q2 collector voltage measures at negative 6.37 volts with a fresh 9 volt battery at room temperature. This unit sounds nice at negative 5.7 volts, so I'm leaving it as is. If you'd like to get that voltage closer to 0 volts, an easy way is to drop the resistance of the 33K resistor on the collector of Q1. Here I'm clipping another 33K resistor onto the 33K resistor that's in the build, which will drop the effective resistance to roughly 16.5 kilo ohms. You can see how this decreases the voltage on the collector of Q2, and the trim pot can then be used to set the voltage to a lower range than previously. For artwork, I'm using rubber ink stamps with a pigment ink pad. For permanence, the ink should be heat treated or covered with a clear coat. A matte clear coat has little effect on the final appearance, whereas a glossy clear coat makes the finish take on more of a motor oil look. Note that I also gave the knob a matte clear coat in the build on the right to test out the result. It didn't adhere very well and you can see that it's chipped away in some places. The knob on the left is uncoated. Finally, we'll install a large knob on the potentiometer and the pedal's ready to go. Remember that we have a link to our web build guide in the description below, which has the full layout, bill of materials, and an easy way to add all necessary items to your cart. Any additional parts and tools that were used in the build process are listed in the description below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date with new videos like this one.